right. school right. on the first day because they had no drivers. They had like you know, 20 routes and five right. drivers or something. Right, just didn't have school. Yeah. And where was that? I don't remember. Did you? In Maine? It was in Maine, yeah. I can't remember the town. It wasn't a big town, but they just couldn't open school. Yeah, and the... They, the they only had like three drivers. Like they had like less than 10 drivers and 20 routes. The they news report was actually, it kind of focused on, um, oh, what's the name of the... Oh, that's terrible. I can't remember the name of the contact. Bloomer? Um, no, the guys who, they provide bus service. It's like for Sierra. Yeah, first food. Uh, yeah. yeah, it was a different one. You'll, you'll know it if I said it, but anyway, the, they were saying they can't hire people and they had, you know, signs out by the side of the road, please come drive with us. You know, we'll give you a signing bonus. Are we still feeling that? Or yeah, mm -hmm. I think we're down to 18 now, right? Yeah. With that. Well, well you know, we have interviews coming up, too. So. We have interviews yeah. next week, so we are, we're always hopeful. We're always hopeful. But it is, you know, it's not a problem that's going to be going away. So, again, to circle back, I mean, that contracted services line for some of our needs is going to be... Yeah, a continuing issue. So not to get too far in the weeds, but I think we're going to have six budget transfers thereabouts to vote on. Um, we're also going to have to vote to cover the school nutrition deficit, and right now I'm showing that at about $276,000. So that's not surprising, um, considering the quarterly reports we've been looking at. It's not great, but it also reminds us that um, it wasn't a bad idea to put the $200,000 in the fund balance um, for the coming year um, to actually put allocate those, those revenues to the school nutrition program up front so that we don't end up having to do this year after year. Right. And we've been working with Peter um, on different ideas of ways to... Uh, yeah, Peter Esposito. Mm -hmm. um, to increase revenue. So yeah, yeah. I think we're going to see some some nice changes there. I, I have to note down below the general fund uh, little set of bullets there halfway down the page about school nutrition. Basically, still seeing the same spending pattern at year end, which is more on staff and less on supplies. Um, I've been talking with Peter and Brenda about um, some accounting procedures. They're end of the day cash up stuff, and they're trying to do some streamlining. Um, and they've got some really good ideas in terms of how to get the money from the schools into the bank without having so many staff people involved. And um, obviously, people have to count their own cash drawers. But again, not to go into the weeds, they're looking to streamline line that a little bit and um, save some hours for the particularly the K2 schools, holding that into some of the one worth process. So that's kind of neat. Um, and again, you know, in, in, in my notes I said something about the, and I will say when I write the formal notes, something about that $200,000 being really critical so that we're not depending on the year-end transfers and hoping that we have sufficient surplus to make that, um, to make that a reality. Um, and then the, the final thing on school nutrition that's in the offing for fiscal 19 is the Stockholm Benefit Savings debit card program. <coughs> that you've heard about at the last couple of meetings. Right. Um, it, is, it is moving along. We don't really have an order of magnitude of what they think they're going to be making for the donation yet. Initially, they had said five cents per transaction. Right. But I think they are kind of hedging that a little bit because they don't really know how to quantify what that might look like. We're hoping for some promotional material soon to, so that people can go out, we sign the contract um, with them. So now it's just a matter of when will they be ready to kick it off. Or I, I'm imagining mid-September that'll happen. Because I think that needs to be a big push um, for the communications committee too, mm -hmm. to sort of um, explain to the general public how it works. Mm -hmm. And then it's really no skin off their back. Saka Bideford is, is the one paying the change thing. Right, you change banks, you change banks, <laughs> which you make your plans for yeah. them, right, right. 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 but they're paying the school mm -hmm. department a portion. Yeah, I, would, I inquired if they knew approximately how many um, Scarborough residents <coughs> currently bank with them, and that was like information that they could give me here. But it would be interesting to try to kind of think about and figure on average, how many times a day do you use your debit card? A lot. You know, right. depending on work day versus not, mm -hmm. if I pack my lunch or not, um, I might, on average, use it at least. Back to school shopping. Right. <laughs> 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 burning your car up. 
part of. Yeah, and you I think that's the person. Yeah, right. I mean, Christmas shopping is. It, there's all these things that are coming up. So the sooner we can sort of get that information from them, we can yeah. benefit yeah. from it. I think the the concept of you know five cents a swipe or two cents a swipe is is really beneficial to us versus somebody making a donation based on earnings or based yeah. on you know if we make this much money then we'll give you a percentage of that. The the concept of per transaction is huge for us because yeah. it's just what you were just saying like everybody swiping their card all day long. Right. And it's not dependent on whether it was a five dollar okay. transaction or a twenty five dollar transaction or a five hundred dollar transaction. It's still the five cents in our in our little Hanford like, oh, these five <laughs> 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 separate. <laughs> these are for my mom. These are for my sister. And, oh my god! Yeah, I can see you working. <laughs> there. Yeah. They're gonna tell yeah, you not to come in anymore. <laughs> Um, so we're also just at that point of creative funding sources and private-public partnerships. We're also exploring other avenues with that, and um, at our next school board workshop, we'll have a really exciting presentation to share with you. So cliffhanger on that one. Wow. Donations, raking it in. <laughs> um, so I think we'll, if we take a quick look at the draft here, um, what you have is the typical layout of what you're used to seeing, and I'll have, again, the formal final documents for next month, but you've got the general fund on the first page, expenditures and revenues. On the second page, the year-end layout is a little bit different. It shows you fund balance um, trajectory from the start to the <coughs> And then you go into other funds, school nutrition, adult education, and then the federal and, and local grants on page three. Um, so, I'm going to draw your attention actually to page two, where at the top you have the breakdown of general fund surplus balances, because this is the question that's sort of uppermost in our minds, and we can talk about how these things occurred. There's some notes on on uh, the sort of bullet sheet that I've given you, but essentially, um, what we've said is that we started with a fund balance at the beginning of fiscal 17. Ooh, that's a typo. Um, that third line down where it says undesignated fund balance 630 2015, should say 16. Quite the draft, right? Um, and then if you look at the center section of that, you can see fund FY17 appropriations balance. That's the amount that we came in under budget on spending. And the revenue balance is the amount that, unfortunately, we came in under budget on revenues. The year-end adjustments right now is just covering food service. Um, uh, there's also a little yellow box at the top of the page where um, if the town is closing out any old CIP funding, um, we may see a little bump in there. Also, if there's any audit adjustments that we need to make, sometimes they'll show up in there. Um, and then the FY17 year end balance is what we lost or gained just within the fiscal year. Um, what I would have loved to see is the FY17 appropriations balance of around $850,000 generating a much larger year end balance than $82,000. Mm -hmm. The reason that it doesn't do so is because of the revenue shortfall. And so, I'll flip you back to the first page. At the top, you see budget to actual on expenditures, and you see that we've generated about $850,000 of unused money, budgeted money. How did we do that? Um, again, in, in my presentation, I'll point out some of the larger areas that that happened. Um, I've noted a couple of them on the sheet. Salary and benefits personnel is somewhere in the vicinity of $140,000 in turnover savings. Special education tuition is about $200,000. Energy, utilities, and insurance, um, some facility costs were favorable, and we saved about $100,000 there. Um, the biggest piece is um, the curtailment that Julie and Tom both put into place. In, at the end of April, and we've talked about that before during the budget conversations. Essentially, 
we said we really need to try to create as much fund balance as we can at the end of this year to help us move forward. Um, so about $350,000 of that $850,000 can actually be attributed to holding back on spending. Um, both in the instructional side, where we're talking about you know, professional development, supplies, um, contracted services, sticking with only the essentials and you know only needs not nice to have. And then the other side is on operations, so um, facility, transportation, again, only needs no, not nice to have. And I would, um, not even not nice to have, but what is it that you could do without? So some of them are needs, but um, we we decided to either defer that or um, just not make those investments. And so um, that that is something that is really challenging to do, and uh, particularly at that point in the school year. So for us to be able to have generated that much mm -hmm. is really a testament to the leadership and you know our strategic thinking around that, and it's a very good thing that we. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I was going to say. Mm -hmm. thank, thank God we did. Yeah, because then if you go to the second section, which is revenues, you've got almost a $500,000 shortfall in revenues. And up until yesterday, I was pretty confident that we had about a $200,000 shortfall in revenues. Um, unfortunately, yesterday I got information from the town finance office that the estimate that they had given us when we were building the budget of what the remaining Wentworth funds were was not accurate and that we were going to be short in that line. So that's... Okay, so uh, just to clarify this for me. Yeah, yeah that, that's uh, pretty much where Julie and I have been. So this whole hullabaloo about Wentworth funds and it wasn't even as much money as we thought. As we were told. So, let me, let me clear. The number we got from this town finance office was not the correct number. So now we're our whole four. <laughs> we're forced to yeah. take on the hit of two hundred eighty-five thousand dollars. Actually, let let me clarify a little bit because Julie and I were looking at the numbers and, and how they played out. What as I understand it, at the end of fiscal twenty. 16, at the time when we were generating the extra fund balance by paying that service with unexpected Wentworth funds, the town finance office put $300,000 more into debt service at that time than they did, uh, than they said they were going to. So they bonded for more? They didn't funds. bond for more. They had the existing funds that they needed to use, but they used more of them in 2016 than they told. So we thought a million dollars was used in 2016, okay, we're all set, that's great, and now we still have 1.5 million. In fact, they used 1.3 million in 2016. So we have the money, the money is used, was used for the right purpose, the debt. to pay down the debt in the school department, but it was put into that fund balance in 2016. So this audited balance that you see at the top as of 7-1-2017 already included that extra 285 So it's not that we didn't get it or use it for the right purposes, it's that we budgeted for more than we're getting. And I cannot find anywhere where I was told that the amount was changed. I have the original amount that we budgeted, and that's what I was counting on up until yesterday. So, so the good news is that we, that we did the current amount because had we not, we would have actually been in the red, 130,000 at the end of the year. The bad news is that the efforts of the procurement that were meant to help us with FY19 aren't quite Are now going to that job. Save us in, in FY17. Um, so, yeah, so if you, then if you go back to page two and you look at the bottom of that little section, you see our undesignated fund balance, again, not audited, but you know, probably fairly close of 200 grand for carry forward. 
Okay, so uh, this is nitpicky, and because now I'm just kind of annoyed with this whole thing. But so community services. So not only that whole two hundred eighty-five thousand dollars is a little bit annoying to me. But then down here, we're owed four hundred sixty-one dollars from community services. We're owed seven hundred eleven dollars from community services. We're owed thirteen thousand three hundred sixty-six dollars from community services. Um, let me say that's not exactly owed to us. What that is, is we budgeted an amount that we expected we would receive for those purposes. So the 29539 for example, that we received for space rental is what they should have paid us. They didn't hold back $461 that paid the bill. We think we're going to generate it. Um, the other places where we've got revenue shortfall are in the UK, which is another whole cool story because there's a Medicare or main care seed requirement that the state takes out when you have students in special purpose private schools. They take out a portion of the EPA to pay those schools directly, which back in the day we used to pay through tuition. So, Fundamentally, what you see is lost on the GPA side, you make up for by not paying it to the private school and the tuition account on, on the expenditure side. But it, um, it makes things kind of fuzzy. I think this highlights, hopefully highlights to um, the general public, and I think it's a story that maybe we need to um, say more often. But estimating our budget so early in the process, this is what happens. This, I mean, these are small, tiny little numbers, most of them, but they add up to make a significant issue for us now looking forward. Absolutely. So continuing to sort of nitpick in, in all of these um, nickel and diming everywhere, adds up and, and ultimately could create a larger problem, not just for the school department, but for the town. Mm -hmm. If we could come in in the red, the town would then be trying to find $130,000 or whatever it was. Like, it, well, and the other is remembering that this is just one piece of it. This is just looking at revenue. We have these other two other major areas that are highly volatile, one being personnel, not knowing um, Again, we're budgeting in April for who we think we're going to be able to hire, and then who we're actually able to hire is sometimes different. And, and what, what their, their needs are, what their circumstances are for insurance, what their needs are, what their levels of education are, you know, and so there's that is very volatile. And then also when you look at students, you know, we're again we're budgeting for the students that we know we have coming. Um, but one student could register tomorrow that could need significant services that yeah, we absolutely. absolutely would provide, and it could cost you know ten to a hundred thousand dollars, you know, depending on what types of services those students need. So again, to your point about nickel and timing the budget, um, that is a risk that we run when we when we present a budget and then we end up going two hundred and nine thousand dollars below level services. That certainly puts us in a very very vulnerable at the school department. And already, you know, just knowing our current status um, and prior to the budget passing, <coughs> we've made some adjustments. We've um, tried to find some efficiencies. We had a resignation of our art and residence, uh, artists and residents that we didn't fill. We increased some class sizes at the high school, and we have a classroom te uh, high school teacher who's filling that position. Not a huge chunk of money, but we're trying to find every ounce of savings where we can. And this happens. This is not like something new that we're doing this year. This is what we're always doing throughout the budget process. We will have to take extreme measures this year, um, considering um, issuing a curtailment as soon as Tuesday. So saying that we're not going to be purchasing or um, making investments in anything that's absolutely non-essential, that is absolutely essential and critical to the immediate programming that we're going to deliver. Um, and so that's something that I'm going to be asking the leadership council to look really closely at. And so a few other things that have happened, you know, again in April we're projecting student enrollment and we're making decisions about staffing based on what we think enrollment is going to look like. 
this summer, our kindergarten enrollment at Blue Point was higher than we thought it would. Um, and having you know the three K2s the way that we do, it makes it tricky because we can very easily fall on the cusp of class sizes sound like they're low to someone who's, you know, to, to any citizen in Starbrook who's not in the schools, but realizing that if you only have three teachers in a grade or two teachers in a grade, one or two kids can really tip us to um, a, a place where we don't want to be in terms of class size because of the size of the classrooms and the availability of space and things like that. So that's exactly what happened at Blue Point this year, and we had to, like four days before school started, bring a first grade teacher down to kindergarten because kindergarten was at like 22, 22, 21 per class. And then that bumped our first grade numbers up to 21, 21, 21 per class. So it's, you know, just constantly so having looking those, at that and making those adjustments. And having those three neighborhood schools makes it harder to absorb that change. Whereas if it were one so much more efficient. K through two school and you have seven K teachers, you can absorb that increase in enrollment easier. Absolutely. You spread it out over seven teachers rather than trying to find it with these three teachers in one, one tiny school. school. Like in the other two schools. 19, like 18, 19. So again, if you were all in one school, you could be really tiny, you know. And the other thing, if we were to consolidate our three K2s, which is you know not anything that's going to happen in the near future, but I still look at those numbers. Mm -hmm. You know, when I'm looking at projections, which I look at often, and when I'm looking at enrollment, which I look at often, um, I'm constantly doing like the what if what kind of thing. What would happen if we were all in one school? So that's a stat that I keep regularly, um, and we would be able to um, reduce five positions if we five teaching positions if all of our K2s were in one school. And that doesn't count, you know, the triple kitchen staff and the triple custodians. And so, um, you know, obviously there would be a huge cost savings to that. And so one of the things that we're working with Harriman on is like, what's, what does that return on investment look like? And when does it become actually less cost efficient for us to um, have, keep maintaining three schools? And at what point would we be saving money and actually bringing money back into the town if we were to have one school? So that's Something that's a that's a really uh, intense analysis to be doing, and it's again with a lot of what is at this right. moment in time, and so um, that's the you know the kind of risk of projecting is that sometimes you get it right and sometimes you don't, but you you're using the information that you have, and you can also look at historical analysis when we're making those decisions as well. Um, just since we're talking about curtailment already starting as early as next week and the critical, you know, state we're going to be in. I was just thinking of other potential revenue sources or ones that already exist and I was just wondering, do we know, um, I don't, you might not know off the top of your head, but the laptops that seniors have are available for purchase for them at the end of the year. Are people buying them? They no. Right. no. no. <laughs> I was going to say we should have big marketing pushes. I think we year. sold one last year. Yeah. I know. It would be really nice. But I mean, and I think it would be a good deal, but evidently it's not as good of a deal as kids need to go to college. Or, yeah, well, they're four years old at that point. And, yeah. Oh, last year. Yeah, last year. Yeah, they they do, but yeah, that's that's what I'm saying. I thought that last year we might get some. But I think ongoing is less and less attractive. And weren't they purchased like specifically for what's going to work best for students going to school? Like for instance, yeah. they might not have a ton of memory space, but they're perfect for internet research, right? Like I think the high school laptops, oh I think the high school laptops, Terry, do. <laughs> they're <laughs> different than what you have at the middle school. The so middle school is more of a, a Chromebook situation right. where it right. is just cloud. Yeah. But the high school laptop. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because yeah. 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 I wondered if that kind of thing, no, a Chromebook it wouldn't make sense. It wouldn't yeah. Right. It would look like that. Okay. But yeah, I mean, it, it maybe it could be something that you guys might put in, um, you know, some of the marketing materials. Say, hey, don't you, do y'all know? I mean, free um, decals for your laptop. <laughs> <laughs> we can sell those Wentworth bricks, right? Uh, <laughs> so um, it's kind of a good segue, actually, into. I mean, I'm not going to go deep into uh, the other funds because there's not really a lot to talk about. I mean, this is obviously the big topic. Um, and we'll cover those pretty easily in, in the actual report out. Um, but if you have questions as you take it away, please come back to me. But I think it's a good segue into talking about 
um, FY18 and then forecasting because um, you know our <coughs> point three, which I'm sure we'll spend a lot of time talking about with the joint committee. To Jody's point, we need to talk about what that means for the school side and how it would look if we were doing multi-year forecasting. So um, just a quick note about, um, or a couple quick notes about FY18. Um, we'll do a first quarter report because we do the year-end report the first meeting in October, typically we do a first quarter report the first meeting in November if we stay on that um, schedule of having the finance committee meet once a month. Plus we have the joint meetings in between. So we can talk about how that works out. We can have it sooner if we want to. Um, first quarter of 2018 I'm talking about now. Right. Um, we will need to expect revenue falling short again in, in Medicaid billing and we'll talk about why that is, but the short version of that is that the state is still not able to guarantee that they're not going to tap into parents and families' private insurance first for school-based services before they allow Medicaid reimbursement, which goes to a whole philosophical conversation about what's a free and appropriate public education. Right. If a kid needs to finish therapy at school, why should that be the responsibility right. of a parent's health insurance? And I'm or their sure employer. Can, right. <laughs> I'm sure we could probably get Allison or Chris to do a little bit of a... Um, well, and there's a lot of things changing with Medicaid, too, so I'm interested to see where it's going. So maybe we may be able to also get... Um, there's a... a Gal is like a liaison that the Department of Education hired as a liaison to DHHS who's been kind of cruising around and visiting the districts and maybe we could get her to come and talk to them more about what that is. Yeah, I think that would be a thing. I'll ask uh, Chris and Allison what is that. I, I have her name because she actually did a presentation at the main business managers organization. And well, the, we're talking about a referendum question for expanding Medicaid. Right, in exactly. the fall, that would be a, if we could get her before the fall, that would be a good education from the community. Mm -hmm. um, quick question mark, whatever her name is. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty much everything that I have to say about fiscal 18. I'll go into that a little bit more when we do first quarter. And, um, you know, to, Julie, to Julie's point, I think we're basically going to be saying we're curtailing from day one, which is it's hard, but again, you know, we're we're more than cognizant of the challenge we're going to be facing when we are building a budget for 19, and so whatever we can do to um, preserve some of balance is what we're going to be doing. Um, but we, it's not it's, it's just one last point on that. It's not just hard. It's not just hard for us as people who have to create a budget. It's also hard for the teachers who had a plan, mm -hmm. and now yeah. one week into yeah. school, we're saying, oh, by the way, you can, you should probably re look at your plan, because that's not going to happen. And it should be a big downer for, for parents who have kids in the school system. It's unfortunate that this is happening one week into school. Yeah, yeah and what we're really trying to, you know, run interference on is having another budget season like we have. I mean that the toll that it takes to have this three budget referendum vote and the negativity that it's created in the community is just not something that's sustainable. It's not going to be healthy for anyone. And so we need to take all of the measures that we can to avoid that and to come to maintain momentum. As I've been saying, you know, this is our challenge. How do we maintain momentum? How do we continue to improve? How do we keep up with a rapidly changing world? Um, we're, we're educating students for the future, and you know we have to. We have that is that is the free and appropriate education that they have a right to. Um, but I really worry about the messaging and the long-term impact that it has to know that here you are as a student working really, really hard in the Scarborough Public Schools. Our students are super involved, super dedicated, super motivated and driven. And to just hear this narrative all oh. year long, I mean, literally people you're not are worth it. You're not worth it. You're a straight not worth up it. no campaign, and um, that really, I, I just, I worry about the, the long-term impact of that. And so I do think that we know what FY19 is going to look like. We're starting off with a 2.3 million dollar gap that we need to fill, and so we have to take every precautionary measure that we can. Um, I'm also hopeful 
people that we have from staff who are, are planning to retire and that we can, we're really ramping up our um, student teachers and our partnerships with our colleges to, uh, Joanne's leading the charge on that, to, we're trying to double the amount of student teachers we have in the spring than we do now in the fall. I think we have like five mm -hmm. right now. We want to have double that in the spring so that we can be, you know, building relationships with these young um, graduates and that they'll want to come here to Scarborough to work and having a negative <laughs> narrative about our schools, about our community and our ability to support schools doesn't help us in recruitment. And we know that we're on the cusp of like a big, a big retirement. And um, from a financial standpoint, that, that can be helpful because then we can have some breakage. But from a recruitment standpoint, knowing um, what the candidate pools look like, it, we're, we're going to be in a crisis in the next couple of years in education across the country. We just don't have the same number of people going into education as we typically do. We typically have 10 to 11 percent of um, college students going into education majors. In 2016, it was 4 percent, um, the lowest it's been in 45 years. And we know that not everyone who goes to college initially and starts as an education major, major ends up in education. It's usually about 30 percent who actually finish with a degree in education. And we also know then um, it's really hard to keep those people in the education field. So we do have one of the lowest starting salaries in the area. Our, our starting salary with a bachelor's degree for a teacher is $36,000, um, significantly lower than our neighboring communities. And so it's hard for us to recruit people fresh out of college. Um, so we're trying these strategies of building relationships and getting them into a system and you know supporting them with lots of professional development and good collaboration um, as a way to attract young talent to our district as folks retire. We did lose some teachers this year who had been here um, to other districts because of the negativity and where Scarborough were really going. It, 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 it penetrates there. all aspects of the community. It's not just um, not passing a budget. It, it hurts businesses. It hurts. Yeah, really so I think of all the vacationers that were here, like that might potentially buy a house. Like all they saw all summer were signs all over the road. Why like, would I move there and I can move to the town over where there's no sign, no, no sight. Well, and to going back to what we were talking about earlier, when it comes to a free and appropriate education, which our students have a right to, um, it, there's really nothing free about Scarborough education, as you, you know, as being parents in the district. Our students pay for a lot of services that should be provided by the school budget or through the school budget that we just simply aren't able to at this point. Um, and I think that that's something that we also need to be mindful of. Um, we're working on communicating better all of the outside funding sources that we have um, and the ways that our programs are supported by donations and fundraising, um, user fees that parents pay. Um, and so I think that we can do a better job articulating those things so that folks have a better understanding. While we also do understand that there are people in our community who will have challenges being able um, you know, to maintain their lifestyle and the, the tax increases. So we're trying to balance all of that. Our goal is to create the most affordable school budget that we can um, while also still you know, providing the most appropriate education for our students. And so um, one of the things I would say that I'm proud of in this budget cycle, as challenging as it has been um, as a first year superintendent, is that we were able to maintain our values as a school department and um, make sure that we always were coming back to what's best for our students. And there was lots of pressure to make other decisions that may have got more voters out earlier on or um, changed the narrative a little bit or made it more about different passion points and we really held the line purposely to not do those things. And I think that that will serve us well in the long term, but there's going to be some growing pains as we get, you know, get through this. And I'm proud of that because there are districts that Absolutely, all over Maine do that, out of the gate. Put something on the table that's a threat, that's, mm. that creates fear and panic. And it says, and then it always passes when we do that. Like, but 
but are you really going to do it? Well, probably not. I'm like, well, we would really have to do it. Because we don't have cushion. We don't have to be ready to do what we do. Yeah, we don't have cushion. It would, it would be that thing. So, yeah. <coughs> so we've got two, 15, 17 minutes. Um, and I think you know, we're, we're not going to get too deep into the question of multi-year budget forecasting, but I think before we meet with the Joint Committee on um, Monday, a week from Monday, uh, I, I wanted to just get some ideas down. And again, I'm just like you know, doing a little brain dump on the paper here, but um, one of the things I was running through with Jay was that we actually did, and I don't know how many of you are going to remember this, but we, we did a two-year budget projection uh, in 2013 and 2014. And there we go. What's going to be helpful is um, that if we're, if we're going to go into budgeting, then why not learn from what we did in the past mm -hmm. and talk about, you know, the challenges, the pros and the cons, the the agenda. Um, we did a budget in June 2012. We had just finished and passed the 2013 year budget, and we produced a budget projection for fiscal year 2014. It was not especially helpful because what you're looking at right now that was created in June of 2012, by the time we got to the spring of 2013 when we needed to really build the budget and put it out to the public, a lot of things had changed. And Julie and I are working on a document that shows some of those differences. Um, the big deal was, the biggest deal between where we thought we were here and where we, where we actually landed in fiscal 14 was the state <coughs> changing um, the requirement for main purse. That was the year mm -hmm. that they said, oh, well, we now want you more. guys to pay a portion of main purse costs. And for us, that was a little, almost $600,000. So we went through a lot of um, ups and downs with that in our budget process. We passed a budget here for 14 where we decided that wasn't going to happen, that it was politically uh, you know, a nightmare and the legislature would never pass that. So we took that money out of our budget and passed a budget that we then later had to amend in a further ref referendum in August to put it back because the state said, yeah, we really meant it and, and we are really going to require you to do that. So the state said at the same time, we're going to give you GPA for that. So we had to amend our budget. But the, you know, this is a really rambly way of saying it's really hard to do a two-year budget and have it be useful. So what's really important is two things. One is we need to be really clear on why we're doing it and you know what's what's the cost-benefit ratio for putting in <coughs> that extra work and creating that projection. What are our goals? What are, you know for what reason are we doing it? And then secondly, we have to be really clear on what are the parameters and the assumptions that we're making. What are the parameters that we're using to make that second year? Um, that second year projection. So what I've given you here is some of the assumptions that we made and the areas that we were thinking about. How did we decide what to guess that people would have for insurance costs? Mm -hmm. What would you know? What are the premiums going to be in 2014 when we're sitting in June 2012? Yeah. Um, what are our salaries and benefits going to be looking like? What's the in purse going to be looking like? Well, we thought it was zero. Well, it's sure now, especially it can be wildly different year and year yeah. and unexpected. Right, right. Exactly. usually like twenty-one percent and then three percent. Right, right. like crazy. Right, it seems it seems like waste. It would be a waste almost of a waste of yeah. time. Well, it's I'll tell you, it's daunting. It's not. It, it depends on how you come at it. It's not necessarily a waste of time. It can be a useful exercise. But there has to be an understanding that it's just that. It's an exercise. If there's not going to be, we know that when we build a budget in June for the end of next year, that that's already going to be weird. Yeah. And I've, I've made some notes this last year in 2016-17, when we built the budget, from when we built the budget to the end of the year, 
we had 32 people resign at the end of the year, and we had nine more resign in the middle of the year. So when you say people have resigned, that means new people have come on board, and those people are at different salary levels. Different insurance. Different insurance, exactly. So people have babies, too. Right. And we also Is had, that allowed? Do we allow that? <laughs> no. We also yes, had increased our education. Yes. In the course of, this, of the 2017 fiscal year, we had 145 anthem enrollment changes. And that's what Julie's saying, you know, I had a baby, I got married, I got divorced, I'm, you know, I need insurance, I don't need insurance. 145 changes in a 12 month period. For how many people? For 500 people. That's a lot. Not all of them are eligible for insurance, so maybe 450 people, right? Right, but that's, that's, a, that's a big percentage. percentage of... And so what, what yeah. we're saying is, you know, even in one year's budget, it's a wild guess. Right. That makes me in crazy the second about year's budget, what people say. Well, it makes me crazy when people talk about like run schools like a business. Well, this is a business. We don't produce a pen. We can't just say this is how much pens cost. This is what plastic is. Even if there's some volatility in the plastic market, we can adjust for that in some ink. I mean, well, it's not the same thing. It's the people organization. We can't. We can't budget the finance committee. Yeah, I hate it. <laughs> but I guess my my fear, one of my fears in this. Um, discussion, and I think it will be a, a hot topic at the joint meeting, is that the minute something goes on paper, it seems to become like, well, you said here that it's this amount. Yeah. And in this sort of um, world of education and having humans as our product, our widget, you can't predict that 18 months ahead of time. And be held to that, um, which is which is part of the, it's part of the communication piece. It's like, and that's the the to what end question. If we do a two year projection, is there a way to clearly articulate that the two two year projection is based on these assumptions, and these assumptions will change? I guess will my inevitably change. My question is, do we as a school department find it beneficial? I don't, do, I don't want to do. I don't want to do something that isn't beneficial to us. It's just then it just becomes a task, and, and we have sure. other things that we need to do as a school department. So if this creating an extra year out is a lot of work and not beneficial, those seem like two big negatives to me. Well, I think one of the things I, that Kate and I are going to be working on, and by Kate and I, I mean Kate, um, <laughs> is really taking a look, and this is. And this is a, an interesting year to look at because there was a really unpredicted mandate and that happens all the time, right? I know that some people think that we can just choose to not like transition to proficiency-based education, but we actually can't. Like there's a law that says we have to do this. And so that's what happens when you talk about that free and appropriate education in Kate. we got to dig that graphic back out. I think we underutilized that this year. You know, one of the pressures we have on that is unfunded mandates. Uh, how happen. about the teacher evaluation law? Right. That was, how um, much yeah, money did that cost yeah, over? Yeah. I, mean, oh, I think they gave us $1,500. That was really <laughs> nice. <laughs> Maybe but that's the point. Right. And yeah. so that squeezes in on that, but also, you know, the reality <laughs> of our community's ability to be able to pay because the state has decided that Scarborough can't. And so they have shifted the burden to our taxpayers. That's not something we decided. The state has decided that. And, you know, for Scarborough, we're kind of getting it on both ends. The state's over-calculating our valuation in the EPS formula because the way they do it is based on different metrics. And then when our actual valuation comes in, it's lower than what we're used to having. So now we're getting the squeeze on both sides of that. So there's a lot of these external pressures that are outside of our control. Um, and, and my worry is that if we if we are responsible in our estimations and we estimate in a responsible way, then it's going to make it look like we're projecting really large increases. Mm -hmm. And if we are tight in our projections and overly optimistic in our projections, then it's going to upset people when the, the new, when the actual yeah. number comes out. So win. I feel like it's setting us up for exactly. immense failure. I think that it would fuel all kinds of anxiety and tension in our community yeah. that already clearly is there. And I, so I, I don't really see at this point the benefit of it. Um, 
I do think that there's a need and a benefit for really specific strategic planning and having priorities and having really clear um, understanding of who we are and why we exist and what kind of organization, what kind of school district we're trying to create, what kind of community we're trying to create, and then having to be really clear about our collective commitments and our values. I think that that work is important. And then measuring all of our decisions against those things um, towards meeting our annual goals, I think that, that that's what businesses do. That's what healthy organizations do. They have a really solid foundation and they, they check all their decisions on that. Um, and I think that taking that route gives much more productivity <coughs> towards how we're going to be prioritizing our resources as they become available to us than us trying to decide, like, I have no idea what my staff is going to look like in the next two to three years when we have well over 13% of staff that could retire today. So for me to try to make that projection with all of those people at the top of our scale is not at all going to be accurate. I mean, I know it's not going to be accurate. And to, and to take Kate, who already does human resources and business and all of our all of contracts and I mean, the whole list of things that Kate does, to have her doing this as an exercise in the at this point of the year, and then having her doing it again in December, right. and then having her do it again in April. She already does do it multiple times right. in a year as we learn new information about Not that. Good use I'm time. really concerned um, about is that the best investment that we can make in terms of our existing human resources. But to that end, I do think the tool that Kate is going to create for us, where we're going to be able to look at what was our FY13 approved voter approved budget. What was our FY13 end of year actual? What was our FY14 voter approved budget? What was our FY14 um, projected? What was our FY14 actual? <coughs> or the other way around? Right. But what I think, think it was going to be, and then what it is, right. where did we land? And because if there's, you know, if there's a 10 percent discrepancy, which is in some of these initial numbers I was looking at, I that to me is just anxiety. And not even just what was approved. How about well, it's actually sent. No, no. I would like three columns. What was needed, right. what was approved, what was and like what the was the actual. Because the, the budget where we land at the end is not yeah. where we need to be for a student needs based budget. Well. In, the, in the last six years, that has not been the case. So I would like to see three columns so we can see, oh, yes, yeah, this is what the professionals decided was the correct amount that we need to run the school department. Here's what we landed on, and here's what the actual was. Mm. That's really different. Those are three very different numbers. Yeah, and then just to create that, just for us to decide, if it's, I mean, that's time and effort, right? That's, that's going to take Kate some time to do, um, which I know she's going to happily do. Well, I think that, you know, that's something that's, that's um, I think that's going to help us in our decision making about whether this adds value or not. It's just a nice snapshot of, oh, we did this one, let's see what it looks like. Let's see what, what the outcome was. Um, and we actually have a real world experience that we can we can look at. So I don't I don't mind doing it. Well, and um, a couple other factors that you have here too, Kate, just bringing our attention to our collective bargaining cycle. So that's another area that's volatile because mm -hmm. we have to bargain fairly, and so that adds another layer of complexity to it because everyone's not on the same exact cycle. So you would have some mm -hmm. conflict that would be well, in the midst of yeah, there's a couple things about that. One is that, to Julie's point earlier, when we were doing the analysis of the current teacher's collective bargaining agreement, we assumed that every teacher working on the day that we did the analysis would still be here in three years. Right. We know that's not true. true. So again, we're doing worst case scenario. Well, you know, worst case is nice if they want to say. But we're saying, you know, all these people are going to increase and we're not going to have any new people coming in at a lower rate, but we know that's not the case. So again, you're creating a maybe a falsely inflated number. And to be honest, with you, that's uncomfortable during negotiations because when we're putting sure. together a salary package with benefits, we have to make it for the full amount because anyone we hire could come with a full family need for health insurance. Right, right. And people on the other side of the table are saying, well, that's not really the reality. That's not what we have. Well, you could all be gone tomorrow exactly. and replace with full family. So that's and what we, we can't to not plan for it. Exactly. Right. Right. And so that's yeah, very right. difficult. Right. But again, to, and to your point with the years showing what was 
needed, yeah. what was budgeted, what was actually used, it's similar to the contract, right? Like, what was what was needed, what did we decide was needed at the beginning? And then we have what, yeah. was, one more piece, you know, what was actually used. Right. Because that's the minute we put that out, it becomes this big thing for three years that the teachers are getting huge increases. Well, if we look back at a contract, you very well may see that that's not necessarily the case. Right. And we did a historic people kind of show that when the new people came, it was much less than when we had. Right. This last piece I just gave you, that's the piece that we handed out uh, on April 6th for the school board workshop. And, and again, it points to all the items that were in motion. Yeah. This is for the fiscal 18 budget. Uh -huh. And once again, just saying, these are things we didn't know in April of 2017 about the 2018 budget. Right. So if we're trying to do mm -hmm. a 2019 and 2020 budget, these are the same kinds of things that we're going to be looking at that are going to be shifting, and shifting ground underneath us. Okay. We have to go next slide. Okay, we're very happy. Do they continue?